brain is bombarded with sensations and feelings, but has no idea what they are or where they come from. During the first few years of our lives, our brains develop so that we can identify these feelings as love or rage, fear or happiness. With this understanding, we can start to manage these intense emotions. This film is about how our brains develop in the formative years and how this development influences the way we deal with emotions throughout our lives. Bad environment out trumps everything. If you take a bunch of people with very, the best genes possible and give them the worst experiences, they'll come out much worse than people with the worst genes possible but really privileged backgrounds and very good parenting, for example. But these are complicated questions and I think they'll become clearer in years to come. But what we do know is that genes don't rule everything. Mm -hmm. They have an effect, but their effect is determined by the kind of experiences we have. A lot of people understand that early experience will have some impact on kind of the kind of person that you are. But a lot of people may not appreciate as much that these early experiences are also built into your biology. So they actually shape the way you react to other people through your life. Understanding the neurobiology helps us to have a more accurate perception of what babies can and can't do and what they need. One of the basic things to remember is that we're born with billions of neurons in our brain ready, ready there. They're ready formed and ready to go, as it were. But what they don't have is any connections between them. Towards the very end of pregnancy, um, the brain starts connecting up those neurons with what are called synapses, making links between the neurons. That continues in the postnatal period for about a year, 15 months maybe, of absolutely intense connecting up, right. which is the brain's way of reacting to all the stimuli that are around. So if you look at a brain at birth, and you look at all the neurons, they're all there, but there's no links. If you look at a brain of a three-year-old, loads and loads of connections are forming all over the place. At the same time, lots of neurons that aren't being used are what they call pruned, they die off. And the different kinds of experience we have will give rise to develop different kinds of brain pathways. Experiences that are familiar, routine, that the baby experiences over and over again, the brain recognises these are going to be the most useful connections and the most useful pathways to keep. And the things that aren't used so much just dissolve away. So gradually the brain shapes itself into a very specific, unique brain to this person in their particular set of circumstances with their particular parents or caregivers. The brain is an incredibly complex organ. Thinking more about its evolution helps us understand human behaviour and how we respond to our emotions and impulses. In our evolutionary history, parts of our brain are pretty indistinguishable from a reptile's brain. Other parts of our brain are very similar to the brains of almost every other mammal. And other parts of our brains are quite unique to primates and particularly the prefrontal cortex, which is the part of us that helps rational thinking, that sort of thing. The prefrontal part of that cortex really plays the biggest role in, in our social interactions and it provides a platform in the mind, or in the brain even, where you can step back and look at your emotional reactions and start to exert some control over them. In the first year or two, those parts, the more advanced parts, if you like, I'm going to use those sorts of terms, aren't online. They're not available for use very much. And actually there was a, a very worrying study done in the States fairly recently which showed that I think it's as many as a quarter of parents thought that their babies should be able to control their emotions and should be able to control themselves, which is not only inappropriate, but literally their brain equipment isn't there to manage their emotions in that way. So, you know, you can't really expect self-control until at least the age of two, if then.
emotions are coming and going the whole time. Of course, in babyhood, you need a lot of help in managing those ups and downs. And it's the parent's job to really pay attention to the subtleties of that up and down. Exploring how the brain works shows that babies do not understand and cannot control their emotions. Parents need to recognise this and provide secure emotional support that gradually helps a baby learn how to cope with their emotions. In those first two years, a baby is learning about emotions, basically, and how to relate. So, you're my mum, you come into the room and smile at me, I mm. smile at you. Next time you come to the room, I'm going to smile at you. That's in my body, in my being. That's what we call a procedural memory. It's mm -hmm. rather like learning how to ride a bicycle or drive a car or play the violin. They're embodied experiences. Our attachment patterns are of those of that kind. They're, it's, they're forms of procedural learning. I learn that to survive, I'm going to not cry when my mum comes into the room. In fact, I'm going to learn to ignore the fact that I've got these feelings which might lead me to cry. So in fact, I don't even know that I have these feelings anymore. They become bodily feelings and I separate from them. But it's a learnt behaviour, essentially. And it does, doesn't mean the distress isn't there, as you say. So these things that parents do without obviously knowing about the biochemistry mm -hmm. are affecting the biochemistry. Children who were brought up in the most depriving institutional orphanages, some of the most notorious ones in Eastern Europe, when their brains have been scanned, we've found that whole areas seem to have very little activity in them. If I'm sitting in a cot and no one ever comes, then whole parts of my brain are not going to be working in the same way. The connections aren't going to be forming, the neurons aren't going to be firing. There's a part of the brain called the corpus callosum, which links left and right brain. The left hemisphere is much more to do with cognition and thinking. A right hemisphere might be much more to do with emotion. What we know is that certain people have a much thinner, less complex, less rich corpus callosum with less nerve endings in it as a result of the kind of experiences that they've had. So it's not just that some neurons die off through lack of use, but there's always lots of pathways. Some of us have richer, more connected brains than others. So more good experiences give rise to more complex brain systems, better connections between the different bits of the brain. Looking at the brain in this way helps explain why some older children behave in particular ways. One of the key things they'd find difficult as a result of early neglect or high levels of trauma is that they're likely to become less adaptive. In fact, even in utero, the fetus of a very depressed, anxious mother, when you give them a stimulus which might worry them, like a loud noise, they calm down more slowly. And we find the same with securely attached children. You give them a stressor, like the mother leaving the room. They're very anxious and they cry. When their mother comes back, they calm down really quickly. They also have much more flexibility. They go back to normal much more quickly. With many of the traumatised and abused kids we work with, they become much more inflexible and much more rigid, or they become incredibly chaotic and fly off the handle very, very quickly. And so a neuroscientist like Daniel Siegel would argue that that's to do with the lack of good connections between the different parts of the brain. Flexibility comes with complexity, and rigidity or chaos comes with the lack of complexity. If your prefrontal area, the social brain area, hasn't really been stimulated in a very helpful way, you may not have the same capacity for self-control, for pausing and reflecting on your feelings than somebody who's had more input early in life. And these are things that have a huge impact on people's lives mm. and their relationships. But they don't necessarily realise where it all began. A parent's attitude, even right at the beginning of infancy, has some sort of diagnostic value. There was a study of one-month-old babies which asked the parents to rate their babies as better than average or below average on a range of sort of behaviours. And they followed up these babies 40 years later and these middle-aged people who had been those babies were found to have their whole lives had actually in some way been shaped by those parents' attitudes to them. 
because the more negative parents produced people who were not secure in their emotional attachment, in their emotional lives, whereas the parents who were very positive about their babies did produce secure people. In relation to the kids that we work with, or in infancy research for babies or with adults, the brain research has really helped us understand that people who look the same on the surface are actually living in quite different worlds because different parts of their brains are responding to mm. exactly the same stimuli. So, for example, many people who have been very traumatised are living in a world which doesn't have given space to think because they're perpetually in a what we call a fight-flight state of mind where you're always frightened about what's going to happen next. Mm. And if you imagine being a baby who lived, who was brought up in a home where there was violence and shouting and you never knew, did know what was going to happen next. If a parent did come to you, you didn't know if they would be nice or shout or scream. You have to be incredibly vigilant mm. and watchful. That's the only way to survive. And so that becomes one's primary default state of mind. When we're working with kids, we really need to know if they're in that kind of state of mm. mind or if they're in a very, very dampened down state of mind. Often we try to do work which people aren't ready for. We try to get them to think about things when they're not in a space for thinking. What's really important is that we find, as professionals, find the resources inside ourselves to empathise, because it's only if our clients and our patients have some experience of being empathised with that they will be able to develop that capacity and give it to their children. You need, as a professional, to be very firm, but you also need to be very nurturing. Mm -hmm. And managing those two things at the same time is, I think, the goal for a professional working with disturbed families. Yes, yes, yeah. People are often very worried that by stressing the importance of infancy, you're kind of saying everything's cast in stone, and if you miss out in infancy, you've had it, which really isn't the case. The brain is designed to adapt to reality, so it's constantly adapting and learning. Those connections that are made in that first year of life so rapidly and intensely continue to be made, just at a much slower rate. If circumstances change or if we need to learn some new things, we can. Otherwise we'd, be, we'd really be done for, because we'd just be very rigid and stuck. So it's not a, a message of sort of doom in any way. It's just saying babyhood sets up your basic equipment. Mm. So let's, you know, that's the most kind of sensible, cost-effective and helpful time to get it right. Babies are emotional beings. They are not able to recognise the sensations and feelings that can overwhelm them. Parents need to understand how intense and unmanageable these feelings can be and respond accordingly. Neuroscientific research suggests that the way parents interact with their babies affects their brain development. Supporting parents so they can provide a secure emotional environment will affect their babies in a deep and profound way for the rest of their lives.